Hi everyone, it's Phil here from Ashton Leather and today I'm outside Horween Leather. We're gonna go inside and talk to Nick Horween about how he's developed a new leather. So when you look at a piece of Lux and you are you got a boot or a shoe or a jacket, and you compare that to something like Chrome Excel, what would you say are some of the defining characteristics that make Lux a little bit different? So you know, Chrome Excel, Chrome tanned, Vegery tanned, hot stuffed, air dried. Uh, polished grain. It's completely different so than the polar opposite. Almost the polar opposite, where uh, Essex veg tanned, uh, not hot stuffed, vacuum dried, full grain. Complete, or very grainy, I guess. And it's ultra tumbled. And and very yeah, and tumbled. So it's got a pebble grain instead of a smooth grain. So uh, different in every respect, uh, both in terms of how it feels and even how it. Well, you know how it'll age, and also how it smells. I mean, everything from start to finish is different. Yeah, I mean, the, I guess the the they do share in common an aging component since they're both on a natural base. So on a you know the vast majority of Chrome Excel is on a, is on a natural base. So as you wear it, that top layer of dye, you'll start to see the lighter color come through underneath. Uh, in the case of Chrome Excel, that's kind of like a light brown taupe color mm -hmm. uh, in the case of the arabica lux it's a much uh blonder sort of natural color it's a little bit more of a dramatic contrast from what i've seen the the, the lux has a l even lighter undertone it or, does yeah i'm a little off on that yeah, yeah it's a little lighter yeah so that's is that the the t core term that is a new new term for me <laughs> yeah it's an old term not and not necessarily used the right way all the time in the world today i think it just means a base the base is different than the, than the surface. surface color. What's so? When you say it's an old term, what's your understanding of what where that comes from? Uh, I think it, I think it was it just you know, it just meant that it, basically that it wasn't mill dyed. I think the term T core, if I remember, it didn't mean natural so much as it meant like a lighter brown underneath a darker brown. Okay, I thought this was like a new like internet. Age term. I think it's I think it's an older term. <laughs> okay, but I that's a good skip warming question. He might have a little more insight on that. Yeah, maybe. yeah. Well, tell me about the the development process, not just for the Lux, but maybe specifically Lux, but just in general, like how does a leather become new and different? Because in my experience working here, there's an infinite amount of possibilities. Um, some of them are not great, but others are classics, mm -hmm. like the Chrome Excel and the Latigo and, and perhaps now the, the Lux leather. But how does the development of a new leather article happen? So it can happen a handful of ways. Uh, in the case of the Lux, it was customer driven. So we had a customer that had a specific idea that they wanted us to help uh, help execute. Sometimes it happens by accident, you know, where we'll do something and it's totally incorrect, but it looks okay. So then it becomes, you know, how do we repeat that mistake and make it commercially viable? Sometimes there's new technologies or new materials available, uh, which doesn't, which isn't as drastic uh, as maybe as it sounds in this building. Uh, we know we're just, and it could be different uh, top coats or urethanes or something like that that we're just putting over existing uh, existing methods that might be might give us a slightly different look. Or you know more UV protection or something. It could be something that that might be pretty subtle. The biggest developmental change probably has come recently with the olive tanned. Well, Articles tell me a little bit about olive tanned. Yeah, so olive tan is a is a another tanning process, another preservation process. Uh, it's a European technology, and instead of using you know the wet white base or the um, which is the non-chrome base tannage or chrome base tannage or any, any you know or just a traditional vegetable base tannage you know a tree bark tannage this uses uh, leaves from the olive industry so the idea is nothing's being you know it's all fallen leaves so there's the the the, imp the footprint is minimal you know there's always a footprint there's always an impact when you're manufacturing anything so it's how do you how do you balance the impact of the process uh, in, relate, in relation to what it's yielding. This extract that's derived from these leaves, which, you know, it, in effect acts very much like a vegetable tannage, where it's, you know, the astringencies is what we're, is what we're utilizing. 
Um, the difference being is it's a pretty prescribed uh, formula and technology. So we had to go through a whole auditing and certification process to make sure that the the base product that we were yielding was in line with what the what this company in Germany um, developed. You know, and then once we have that base going, you know, we're free to do. You can iterate like yeah, you we're have free on to, the Essex and me right. Dublin and Derby and Lux. I see. Yeah, once yeah once we get there, then we can we can introduce our own retanges or come up with new retanges. And then from those retanges, we can have we can finish it into a bunch of different products. So it, it branches out pretty quickly. So the olive tan, it sounds like the it's like a veg, but instead of using the tannins from tree bark, you're using tannins from fallen leaves from an olive tree. Right. And that's a little bit more of like a renewable sort of more going green kind of effort. Yeah, I think there was a lot of times it was uh you know, material that was not being utilized at all. I don't know what, exactly what they were using the leaves for once they were done with the with the harvest, and um, and I haven't actually seen how they gather the the leaves or convert it into the extract. I think that's part of their proprietary uh, process, if I had to guess. But yeah, I mean, it's you know, the tanning industry is one of byproducts to to begin with. So anytime that we can use something that normally wouldn't be more, you know, wouldn't be used, or we can turn it into something that's more useful in a different way by putting a little bit more work into it. Um, that's, that's, your, that, that's your job, that's what that's, you do here. Yeah. The olive tin is, um, that was just starting to be developed uh, when I left here almost two years ago. Mm. But what are some of the, uh, can you find that in footwear right now, or what are some of the products that I could find uh, olive tin from Horween? On? Footwear right now, Wolverine and Alan Edmonds, I think are the two main users at this point and there's a there's some you know some more out there but those uh, if you you know if you wanted to go actually get something those would be the two places i would probably start um but yeah it's, it was a long i think we started having the conversation about doing some of that here probably three years ago and then maybe in the last year and a half it became commercially viable you know by that i mean we could repeat we could make the same thing twice uh, you know, and since then we've we've invested in some additional equipment, you know, which has you know applications throughout the process, but is is um, is better at that base tange because you know the the process is not so different from the those other base tanges I talked about, but the the timeline is mm -hmm. so where a chrome tange is twenty four hours, this one seventy two, mm -hmm. so it requires a lot more babysitting. You know, and there's a lot, there's more opportunities for mistakes to be made. So we've got some, you know, some mills now that have uh, timers on them instead of just people turning them on and off. Yeah. It's well, re it's revolutionary. That, yeah. And that's what I think I like that inspires me about Horween a lot. And it gives me sort of hope for the world is, you know, we're sitting in a building that's been tanning leather since the 1800s. And even though Horween has been in existence since 1905 it's over a century now but what i find amazing is that even after 116 years you're still able to create new things using new technologies and perhaps maybe maybe you can tell me is that the reason why we're sitting here today is it because you're able to continue making new leathers no <laughs> I think, I think I was getting all deep and I, I think, thought yeah. I had like the answer. I think that, <laughs> that that, you know, that that helps. And I think there, there was definitely a time where that was the case. And that might be the case now I mean, with the olive tan stuff. I mean, that could end up being the next, the next uh, sort of core product. I mean, I think that that, that was the case when Essex came around, you know, we spent a long time developing that. And I think that that product has helped, um, helped us, you know, because it's, different and new and it's you know it's not not really like anything else that's out there but and that's and we're, we're talking about the Essex that's the veg tan uh, side leather that and you guys you make it on horse too but that's a, a new within the last two decades product I think maybe 13 12 years ago yeah it's probably yeah I think you know come you know it started to get traction maybe recently eight, nine ten years <laughs> yeah. ago I mean the core of our business and even to an extent that product. I mean, it's not, we're using the cordovan bark extracts, which mm -hmm. is the oldest formula that we have. So even when we're doing something new, we're still taking all the old stuff. 
I see. And all the traditional stuff and putting it into, you know, just a newer application. So I think it's really the the uh, stubbornness to not compromise on those really traditional techniques that's kept us that's kept us here because you know, we're a small tannery, so we can do things slower and by hand that bigger tanneries can't do or they don't want to do or it's not you know profitable enough for them to do um not that it's that profitable for us a lot of times but we still <laughs> like to do it but yeah so i mean that's i mean in the court of and chrome excel are perfect examples of that where those formulas are unchanged in you know in a large part you know 100 years basically you know and even you know even though we've taken that philosophy and put it into essex or we've taken that chrome excel philosophy and put it into cavalier which is effectively a, a modern more modern version of chrome excel it's still using the same equipment and techniques and um, philosophies. Why don't you just tell me what is Lux? Lux is a, a leather that's on the Essex base tannage. So we take the Essex base tannage and then we're, we're finishing over on top of that. So Essex uh, and then Lux is a full grain vegetable tanned leather uh, that gets the same blend of bark extracts that we use in Shell Cordovan. Uh, the only difference is instead of tanning it in the pits, we tan it in a drum. So it's a little bit more uh, of an updated tanning method. Uh, it gets a really long milling process also. Uh, by milling, I mean it's, it's a dry tumbling in a wooden drum. Uh, and that has the effect of both softening it and then also giving it a really uh, nice, fine, in this case, pebble texture and a pronounced grain. Yeah, so Lux is a leather that we initially did for shot via 316. That was actually an idea that came from Andrew 316. And he had seen a leather out there in the world that he had liked. So he sent the swatch and just wondered so sort of what was possible and what we thought. And uh, he had some notes on also about how he wanted to age. And well, what did the original swatch that he sent look like? Um, it was just a pretty standard kind of soft, glovey black kind of upholstery weight leather mm -hmm. it was probably you know sort of a more traditional garment almost like a lambskin i guess the grain character was somewhat similar and then the finish was kind of in the neighborhood but <clears throat> you know it wasn't on a natural back like the like the arabica lux is and it wasn't um it doesn't didn't have that that shine either you know, the idea was for something that was going to age, so that immediately meant we were going to try to do it on something that was lighter colored, at the base at least, uh, instead of black on black, which isn't going to change too too much. Yeah, then it was at that point it was just a back and forth based on sort of what what we had to offer at that time, uh, sort of what we were interested in, or what I was interested in, I guess, and then uh, what he wanted really, and so you know, there's some requirements that Shot has in terms of softness and thickness, so that was. That was the basis for a lot of for a lot of what was going on. So it had to be pretty thin uh, for that jacket, and then you know, softer is better for for garment weight stuff. We just started experimenting based on what that swatch was, uh, and you know the notes from from Andrew, and that ended up being you know that really dark coffee color. From there, we experimented on you know, the finish break, was it going to be matte or somewhat shiny? And was it going to be really smooth or kind of sugary like it ended up being? And then how it felt. But, you know, there were some requirements, some uh, performance requirements in there too, because we didn't want the color, you know, the top color, that dark brown color to come off immediately. You know, we wanted there to be some, some break in process to it, especially since you know, it was a 316 inspired jacket. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of speaking to the raw denim world where people were expecting to put a little bit of wear into it before they were starting to see it change. You know, and also it's it's a jacket, so the wear points need to be pretty resilient anyway. Yeah, then we ended up with this really nice soft leather with the natural grain from the long, you know, 12 hour milling process that it gets. What's a normal milling process just to give a sense of scale there? <laughs> anywhere from 15 minutes to two hours. Yeah. So yeah, so anything over, like I would say anything over two to four hours is really long. The shorter end of that milling process being for breaking up the, just the surface or the waxes on the surface for effect uh, up to, you know, the two to four hour mark where we're actually trying to soft it, soften it and give it some, some pebble texture. 
Uh, but yeah, anything over four hours, it starts to be pretty, uh, pretty dramatic in terms of what it does to the leather and the grain. So the grain gets more pronounced the longer you tumble it. And then also that, that pebble pattern, uh, it starts to get very, really pronounced too, but also very variable depending on the height and also where on the height it is. So you can mitigate a little bit of that variability by increasing the time, but not too much. Thank you.